Yes, consider the arts. Um, you, I, I, I have borrowed some images for this presentation. Um, and as we go along, you will see little references on the sides. Um, I have taken images and then done my own thing with them. So this is not the original full image, but, uh, but you'll see the references um, as we go along, if you're curious about where they came from. Um, getting to, yep, uh, here's the plan. First, a uh, brief introduction, um, some preconceptions that I want to outline so that you understand where I come from, uh, then a really quick human experiment, which I'm looking forward to because you will be experimented on by me. Uh, then I will have a short presentation of some concepts and th some kind of uh, strands of thought that I have considered significant in my relationship of figuring out how to position myself in relation to this wonderful world of arts. Um, and then a couple of tips or ways forward. And then uh, the part that I'm looking most forward to is the discussion section where we get to share and, uh, and bounce those ideas back and forth. Preconceptions then, first of all. M my God, when I talk about my God in this presentation and the 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 kind of like the underlying current and of everything that I will have to say um, is our creator, as was already pointed out in the prayer and the introduction. That is one of the key elements also in uh, in discussing the creative pro production of uh, of the creation. But not just our creator, but also a creator who is always leaning forward with this almighty effort to reach uh, what was lost, reach their lost creatures with the intent to restore the relationship, not just with the intent of making sense of themselves to us, but also with the intent to restore the relationship. Um, not just yesterday, but also now. And that is then how, for me, the most meaningful layer of the concept of the present truth comes to play. It is God's self-revelation in context, um, in the relevant context. It can always be identified in the light of the discoveries that have already been made, that have already been written down, that have become the texts that kind of guide our steps. Uh, it's it's almost like these books um, in ornithology where you have an entire book listing different types of birds that you would be able to identify what is what. Um, and I believe that the previous stories serve as such. It's something that helps me identify what, how to how to notice God around me here and now. But the part that truly matters is that God is here and is supposed to be identified here and now, supposed to be recognized and related to here and now. So God's revelation shall never be locked up in the stories lived before us. And I don't think that anyone would subscribe to that idea that it has been locked up. But practically, the implications on the hermeneutics that come with that realization that God has not been locked up are massive, and they also have to do with the question of arts. This way, the present truth means commitment to active tuning in to God's story here and now, the real, the relevant, the truly and immediately meaningful story of God to the ones that God is reaching out to. God desires to make sense today. God desires to speak meaningfully today. God desires to touch each and every one where it matters today, where everyone's personal little fire burns. And that actually links back to then the concept of the, of the creator, because I think sometimes in our discussions, in our, well, in our assumptions about the human kind, about anthropology, we forget that we are still God's creation. And we forget that the parts in us that are unique and different and distinct, the ways in which we make sense of the world differently, the ways in which we process material differently, these are all the result of God's creation in our diversity, which makes which, which means that our maker reaching forward to us is reaching forward to us in full knowing how we tick and desires to make sense for us where it matters to us, where it truly moves us, where it truly touches us. 
And that, I believe, is where the arts come to play in a, in a really significant way um, in our relationship with God. Not just the communication of it, but the actual connecting to it. Secondly, my context, I already outlined that one in the introduction to my person. So Adventist, European, um, and the material that I present today has been has kind of been born in that crossroad between worship leading, creating spaces where people come together to, to encounter the divine, um, semiotics and, and uh, literary studies, uh, communication element, and then theology. But as I also said, I am not a theologian, um, no more than anybody who is trying to make sense of the world in a meaningful way um, and still has God in that picture. So I think in some ways all of us are, but I am not formally. And then there's a set of selected disclaimers. I, uh, I have to acknowledge in advance that my terminology today in the field of arts will be a little bit messy and certain concepts that should be treated separately uh, will not be done justice to as distinct categories. Uh, concepts like, um, like arts um, in the broader sense. Today, I am treating it as an over arching term that includes all of those different strands of arts underneath. Um, then what is connected to this is the, the study of aesthetic, um, which is which is a field that is, again, very complicated, looking at the reception of beauty and reception of arts. Beauty is a third category that fits into the picture that is not necessarily equal to either of those two things. So. There's going to be some of this uh, fluid movement between those concepts, and I will not be, we, we just don't have the time to work on them as separate categories. And lastly, I think that I will be saying things today that will sound off out of context. Um, so I my plea to you is to treat uh, this presentation and this discussion as a full whole to, to understand how it is how anything that I say separately is positioned in a bigger whole that is quite balanced. Well, I believe it to be quite balanced. You can challenge me on that in the discussion section. Let's get to the human experiment. Here it is. I would like you to take a moment to look at this painting. Um, it is kind of contemporary um, if you consider that basically every <laughs> we've had contemporary art now for what would be called contemporary art for about a hundred years. So it's not necessarily that contemporary anymore, but it's a painting from uh, the sixties, uh, abstract expressionism. I would like you to meet that painting right now and see what comes out. I will ask for your impressions in about two minutes. you like us to uh, enter our uh, thoughts on the chat and we can share Ooh, them. You can, out. yes, that would be wonderful There's actually. The, that, that's the way uh, our teacher last week did it and I thought it worked very well. That's beautiful, let's do that. Then uh, then mm. everyone gets to have a go. We don't we have to have, queue uh, for the mic. Linda, we can have Linda share a few of them to us. Let's do that. I don't know if you can see them, Miss Kay, but some of the things that are coming up having to do with flowers and chaos, uh, energy, movement, speed, shows that painting is fun, dancing, chaos in need of order, 
freedom without perfectionism. Ooh, a floral like character. Water splash, people running away. Oh, this is a creative group. People caught in an explosion. Someone lost in a disturbing universe. Art is my life. The black is the mind. Beauty, yes. Seared, bleared, colorful, beautiful colors that make like a summer sky. You're getting some good, you're getting some good material here. <laughs> I really am, attempt, yes. Attempt to be liberated. Oh, somebody doesn't care for it much, but that's to be expected. A circle of different kinds of people looking at each other. The question is not what we do see, but how we feel, perhaps. And I think not good has to do a lot with uh, with how we feel. Um, we also have the questions like freedom or disturbing. Um, those are already creeping in, the things that the painting makes us feel. Mm -hmm. um, chaos chaos mm -hmm. is a theme that's come up. Yes, right. But it, but that that chaos that there we had this chaos in need of in need of order or in need of making sense of it. Uh, chaos does not always have to be a negative um, a negative entity to meet or a negative state to meet. Uh, it's not always that for for everyone. Now, and of, um, and of course, Chris, who is you know a stand up comedian, puts Daniel's little horn in the middle. <laughs> well, I. I usually pull that one up uh, when I meet my students for arts classes or for the reception of the Bible classes where we also discuss visuals. And um, and we've had wonderful interpretations of this. There have been people who have seen the three crosses on um, on Calvary. Um, over here, there are people, and, and then the red becomes the blood. Um, there are people who see flowers and, and people who see murder or like a massacre, basically. So the same painting and so many different readings, so many different respondings, uh, responses to it. Some of them more passionate, some of them favorable, some of them just meh. Um, so you still, you still, the good thing about it is that this image, especially when it's forced into your face like this, uh, it challenges you to engage to some degree. So it's very, um, it's demanding. It demands something, it demands, especially the bits that uh, that are kind of disruptive about it. They demand that we try to make sense and the disruption comes from the fact that it doesn't yield. Um, so the truth is that this painting was, uh, the author of the painting, um, the artist uh, lived here in uh, in England, in London, and it was a chimpanzee um, who got famous for uh, for painting many such very expressive and colorful paintings. Um, so, so I also wonder what what it does to our interpretations and the way that we read the painting, knowing that it was created by uh, by an animal. Anyone? Maybe the not good now turns into oh pretty good for a chimpanzee, um, or maybe the the discussion of or 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 a more or a deeper reading of it, um, you might feel oh heavens how did I, you know how did I assume that that was in there, and of course that also reveals something about uh, what we believe about uh, art, um, what who is the one who makes the meaning? Is it the author? Is it the reader of that piece? Is it the piece itself? Uh, is it possible for a chimpanzee to create something that is legitimately and truly meaningful uh, to me? And now the fact that this painting was created by a chimpanzee, does this take away any of the meaning that I have already attributed to this? Does it any, any in any way erase the emotions that this particular painting evoked in me? So there's already about 20 questions for anyone to consider in the future. Um, whenever you face any kind of piece, um, what do I assume about the relationship of in in reading, you would call it the hermeneutical triangle, the 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 artifact or the text, the the author of the text and the reader of the text or the viewer of a painting. Now, all of this is just so that you would be forced to experience something and be forced to engage. Done that one. Let's get to the part where I share with you some of the concepts that I have found really helpful. 
I want to do that in three parts, uh, the why, the what, and the how. The first bit is the, the why. So why engage with arts anyway? Why would that be uh, a necessary concept to consider? Why arts? And I've just asked this question and now I'm going to ask a question about the question that I've just asked, which is what does the why mean? Um, the way that we, the meaning that we import into that question, why arts? What do we actually mean behind it? What would be a legitimate kind of reason why arts? What is a good answer to the question why arts? Already reveals so much about us. It would reveal our concept of aesthetics, our theology of aesthetics. In other words, how does the concept of art and the concept of beauty actually link into the fact that we believe in a world where God is the creator and wants to engage with us? And it also reflects uh, our personal value systems more broadly. Because that why question can be answered or elaborated on in two different ways. Why are arts valuable or worthy is a question that is different from what are arts good for? And both of these are kind of why questions. Why should I engage? But the underlying assumptions about the need to engage or what is engagement worthy are different. It's the question of the ontological value of arts versus the functional or utilitarian value. Uh, in other words, is it worthy and valuable in itself or is it only necessary as a tool for something? And already there, um, books need to be written and have been written. These two concepts may overlap to a degree, but the positioning of the experiencer is essentially so different. It's a really interesting question on a broader scale as well, the question of your intrinsic value or your value as something that only can be achieved if you serve a purpose. And if you make it even bigger, you could even ask, is God's creation valuable because it is God's creation? Or is it valuable only as a testimony or a reflection of God's greatness? There is something else to consider. And it actually links to also the way that we treat that we treat arts, we treat any kind of artistic creation or any type of creation. Is God saving us um, because we are valuable in ourselves as God's creation? Or is God saving us as a projection of God's nature? Um, there's something to think about, something we don't have the time to answer. But just to demonstrate how the discussion of the arts, actually, when you zoom out, is related to those big, big questions. And then when you when you answer those big, big questions, and then you zoom back in, then those particulars, particularities, they become even more exciting, at least to me. So let me take this, um, let me take both of those sides, because I don't know, I believe that both questions are pretty good. But I think that Addressing only one is probably a bit reductionist. So we're going to do both. First of all, the intrinsic value of beauty and or acts of creation. That we consider them valuable or worthy because they are beautiful, because they have been created. I don't know if you would agree with any of that, but... Um, just because it exists, just because it has been created, maybe it does hold a certain value. And it is definitely true when you think about all the children's drawings that you have to keep somewhere in your somewhere in your cupboard, just because they've been created, they are valuable, right? Um, so what happens later? Why do we have a different approach later? Art can also be valuable as a witness. Um, and this is where it gets blurry with the function, but it is a witness. It's a reporter on the times, on the trends, on the actors in time and space, on the events, on the history of human condition and experience. And as such, it should be valuable and worthy in itself. It has been produced in in that space, it has been produced by those people. It is beautiful and it is valuable as such. 
Um, you could also treat it um, valuable as a window to the soul, just because it is a revealing, a bearing of somebody's um, of somebody's innermost makings. You know that the deepest bits of them. Um, it is valuable in itself. Um, I have poured everything that I have into this painting or into this piece of music. Does this not make it valuable? It can be seen as the window to the soul of the artist, or it can be seen as the window to the soul of the viewer. Us observing a picture made by a chimpanzee and coming up with different things in relation to that painting, isn't it already a valuable moment? Doesn't that already make that piece of painting valuable in itself? And if you zoom out from there, it can be a window to the soul of the community, of the society, of the generation, of humankind in general. Isn't there some kind of value and worth in art as the act of rebellion? It has always been treated as the creative space that, um, that is safe for challenging that is created for challenging, for questioning, for experimenting, subverting, undermining, reforming. That is the reason why in any oppressive structure, in any totalitarian regime, arts have been the first thing to be censored and controlled. I grew up um, for about nine years of my life in the Soviet Union and, uh, and my dad loved jazz music. And obviously that was an absolute no, it was you would you would be considered an enemy of the state if you engaged with that with that well with that American <laughs> um atrocity, uh, which is not only just about the fact that it was uh, in its roots American, but also about the fact that it represented everything that went against the, the the communist idea of equality and harmony, of the sameness of the no, in, in jazz, there are people who are kind of like bringing in their distinct things and they are almost like battling it out. It doesn't make sense. It is a it is a, a non-verbal but mighty tool to undermine the current ideology that the state wants to promote. Thus, there shall be no jazz. And my father grew up um, kind of... <laughs> exchanging in secret alleyways, exchanging these cassette tapes that were, uh, uh, that were a recording from a recording from a recording from a recording uh, that somebody got from Finland um, of a recording of the, of the Voice of Europe radio shows. Um, that just tells you how, if we don't realize that in a free society, how all you need to do is look at, at look at an oppressive society and realize that art has always been seen as a mighty tool of rebellion. Isn't it as that space valuable enough? Now, then perhaps the, the other question, what are arts good for, the functional worth of, uh, of arts? And I think that's in turn can be divided into two different categories. What can they do to me and what can I do with them? In one case, I'm the patient, so to say, of the treatment of art. And in the other case, I'm the agent using art for something. Um, first of all, what can they do to me? First of all, I would believe that they can reveal the unknown. Art as a space for meaning making and for sense making. What do I mean by that? Uh, contemporary um, literary critic and, uh, and critical theory uh, writer and thinker, Brian McHale, I don't even know if he's ever written a paper about it, but he gave a lecture that I happened to be, um, that I happened to attend. And he was talking about poetry in the gutter. Um, which I believe is something that would really benefit um, also theological circles. What is poetry in the gutter? What he was talking about was ultimately that space in comic books uh, where uh, between pictures, you know, that's called the gutter. So uh, over here you have two images, both are uh, comic book uh, 
renditions of biblical stories. And uh, let's, for example, look at the first one of Cain and Abel. And you can only see two pictures. And there is some text, but the text does not describe um, in detail what was happening. If you look at the image, you see the smaller image first. And then you look at the second image, the red big one. Um, and you realize immediately that these are not uh, unconnected. There is some kind of a relationship between these two. So what happens in these pictures, and you would be able to tell me, is plenty, right? Cain and Abel meet, Cain kills Abel. We also know that because of our previous knowledge of the story, but the truth is that this type of visual representation is amazing because none of the actual action is given to us in detail. It happens in the gutter. So what happens in the gutter is we, as viewers, are making sense of it. We are looking at those two men and we are looking at those two men in the other one. We identify that they seem to be the same person. And then our brain automatically assumes that what happened in that gap, in that white little border there, was that one approached the other, pick up, picked up this axe or whatever it is, and then swung it down. Um, and, and all of that does not actually happen in the picture. It happens in us. Now, Brian McHale claimed that the same is true for poetry, that sometimes when you look at the text and you don't even understand why it is a piece of poem, the reason why it is poetry is because of those gutters that are left in the linearity of meaning making that invite you to make sense of it. So poetry is a text that leaves that space, that forces that gap in which you are responsible as a reader for understanding or for meaning creation. For me, what was interesting was that this is a concept from literary studies, but when I was reading the, um, when I was reading the, uh, some theological texts about hermeneutics, something similar came up. Now, um, why does it say here on the slide that it's a solidly biblical proposal? that there is a need for a interpretation gap which would invite in the one who is supposed to make sense. Because I believe that when we look at the Old Testament, and somebody already mentioned that in the comments of, uh, of, the, of the ad for today, that the sanctuary was a deeply artistic space. It was a creative artistic space. And what we have in the so-called Western world these days is this really interesting narrative about the sanctuary having to look and operate the way that it did because of the primitive nature of a slave nation that had been just removed from, uh, from you know, decades of, of long slavery, eroded culture, um, really difficult times so that these people were not literate enough to be handed down their present truth in the shape of the text as we now can perceive it. It's a horrible narrative and terribly arrogant. Basically, we're treating the sanctuary as a text for the dummies. And then we, we move ahead and we go like, hey, we have a much an elevated way of understanding God, right? Well, the truth is that even if some of those elements about, about their, their story were true, they were a slave nation, they had just left an oppressive system, even if some elements of that were true, which I don't think they are, we are still missing out on the fact that this was God's chosen medium for self-revelation. And what it brought along was this massive space left for the participator, participator, not the, not the one spoken at, the participator to interpret. There was a lot of room for personal experience and personal meaning making and personal sense making. And I believe that the arts in the way that we have access to them today provide a similar space. Instead of explaining things away, it leaves those gaps and whilst we might think that explaining things away is a good thing because it provides clarity, here is a text from Routledge, Companion to the Christian Church, from the chapter on hermeneutics. It becomes obvious that the interpretation process is ultimately a transformative event. 
What happens in interpretation is not an actualization of meaning in the sense of reproduction, but a creation of meaning for the interpreter. Meaning in this dialogue, the in, let's put it this way, the interpreter in this dialogue is called to an active and receptive participation. Meaning can arise only through this participatory involvement of the individual. Understanding is always one's own understanding, as no one can understand for somebody else. Understanding does not simply grasp something, but the meaning of that something for me. This actually highlights in a chapter that discusses how to approach the scriptures, the significance of personal and individual agency in meaning making. And I wonder if sometimes we forget that there are different avenues and different ways of providing more space for that. I wonder if sometimes as the stereotypical Adventist church, we are so happy if somebody gets to parrot back our detailed exposition and we believe that to be the transformative act. Once you have been, once you have been sent the text, once you have opened the book, transformation has happened. But we are very hesitant to provide spaces where people can make their own sense, where people can experience their own meaning, where people can actually encounter the divine. And the divine is not encountered in the explaining away, but the divine is encountered in that gutter that forces us, challenges us to engage, to understand, to make sense. And that is where God can truly touch relevantly, personally, contextually. If this is not a challenge or an invitation to engage more with arts in general, then I don't know what is. What are arts good for? They can reveal the unknown. They can be there for me to make sense in a way that is meaningful to me. They can be there to provide that space that is not dictated or controlled or explained away so that God, the creator, can mean the meet the peculiar creature that I am in a way that is meaningful to me. It can obviously also move beyond words. It can address the needs that are not met through logocentric approaches to spirituality. That also links to the diversity of who we are. That links to actually, and I hope, I had a, I had a meeting with a really lovely young woman recently who was in tears because she didn't feel like her spirituality was where it was supposed to be. And when I was poking it a little further, she was telling me, well, it's because I don't, because I don't feel comfortable enough at the Sabbath school lesson, because I feel that there are gaps in my knowledge because I never related to the academia or to the text. I never enjoyed books. And now I feel like because of those things inside of me, I cannot do justice to my spiritual journey. I cannot do justice to God. I need to know more, I need to read more, I need to be able to do better expositions and engage in those theoretical theological discussions better so that my spirituality would be right. And, and I just felt like I'm, I just wanted to cry because that is an abusive environment for living out your spirituality. It is an abusive environment because we have elevated that type of experience or that type of sense making of God over the other types of sense making. And we have forgotten that it is actually abusing God's creation. God did not create us to be people of the book, people of expositions. We were created to be so many different things. And some of us are certain things more than others and vice versa. If we do not engage with art, if we, as people who perhaps don't need it for our personal spiritual journey, are actually telling other people that their ways of engaging with the world and with God meaningfully are lesser or insignificant or random or demonic, we are abusing God's creation in all its beauty and diversity. What else are arts good for? Signifying the unsignifiable. Art can be treated as a liminal space between the possible and the impossible. 
artists throughout ages have been treated as prophets, artists as the dreamers, artists as the ones who kind of somehow have access to a different reality and have tools to express those different realities. Um, this is especially prevalent in in what I'm going to say that term and I have no idea, but some, maybe some of you will start twitching, um, but, but bear with me here. Um, this is especially significant in the psychoanalytic theories of art. So the idea that there are parts of us that are not um, linear, that are not uh, neatly expressible, not even accessible to our reason or to our, to our thought or to this type of exposure to the sense-making. And yet they are relevant, yet they shape the way that we relate to the world. There are elements that we, that we can't reach and yet an artist can. The artist would be always, intentionally or unintentionally, bearing parts that they didn't know about themselves, um, exposing things that they didn't know were there, exposing more than they ever intended to put into a painting or into an artifact or a piece of music. And as such, that is also true communally. They would be exposing things or discussing things or giving giving voice or representation to elements that cannot be explained away, to elements that cannot be fully diagnosed, fully analyzed, uh, fully dissected. One of those, uh, the promoters of this idea uh, is Julia Kristeva, uh, a Central European thinker who wrote a book called The Black Sun which was all about how, how the arts, the, the type of arts that leave a gap or the type of arts that create this friction are there to help people overcome moments when they cannot make sense because their experience is too messy to lend itself to any kind of meaningful expression. Now, if you take that to extremes, we are talking about depression. We're talking about pathological melancholy, about people who are just nothing makes sense. Everything is empty. My grief and the absence of meaning are so strong that I cannot even get it out of myself because the link between my the meaninglessness of my existence and any kind of representation or signification is too far, too, it's impossible. And she would claim that artists, as the in-betweeners, have a skill of actually representing the unrepresentable, of signifying the unsignifiable. And an example on which she builds that, she also uses poetry um, and, uh, and prose, uh, poetry of Nerval and uh, prose of Dostoevsky to demonstrate that it's possible in different genres. But the first one she goes for is the body of the dead Christ in the tomb, far from being a contemporary piece, but the rendition or the interpretation is contemporary, uh, by Hans Holbein the Younger, uh, a, a Dutch painter of the 16th century. And uh, here is this picture of Jesus, very different from the pictures of Jesus that we are used to seeing, even of Jesus's death. Um, you can see that this is an abject body. It is, it is a it is a truly dead body in all its reality. You can see the bluish, greenish undertone of the skin. You can see the rigor mortis in the fingers. You can see the blood. You can see the slightly gaping mouth. You can see the strange half-open eyes. This is God, dead. And she would claim that it is this picture that is necessary. It is necessary for anyone who is experiencing the truly meaninglessness, truly meaningless existence, truly true loss, true feeling of nothing matters. They would need that painting of a truly dead God a truly dead God between weird blocks of stones without any hope or any kind of, any kind of even a, a, 
a tingling of the Sunday morning to come just yet, to be able to relate to it as a human, as somebody who has experienced loss, as somebody who is lost. And she would claim that it is this painting that is necessary, not the beautified, glorified art of entering Jerusalem and not the morning of Sunday, you know, or the ascension pictures, um, which are also necessary. But if you are in the deepest pit and nothing makes sense to you, those images are too far removed from your pain, from the unspeakable torture that you are experiencing, from the valley of the shadow of death to be meaningful, relevant, relatable, helpful. It's just, it doesn't even register. In the light of that theory then, arts can be good for relinking to meaning. And then you can take it to the next levels and express it in more words. What can I do with arts? I would claim that it gives you access. It gives you access to the other. It of course gives you access also inside of yourself, but that perhaps links to what we were just talking about, revealing the unknown, telling you things that you didn't even know about yourself, not just as an artist, but also as a beholder, as an experiencer, as a participator in art. But here, the focus will be on the other. It will give access to other questions, other perspectives, other experiences. And in our stories with God, it is no less significant than any other aspect that we have discussed. In Again, returning to my assumptions at the beginning, if we are talking about a God who is our creator, who is constantly leaning forward to be able to reach out to each and every one of his, his haha, of their creatures, um, or who is intentionally and, and actively reaching out, then we also have to acknowledge that God is at work around us. And understanding those spaces as witnesses, and as revealers, as the places where people go to make sense or to struggle or to wrestle with the deepest darkness inside of them, these are an amazing opportunity to understand, to observe, to behold, to experience something that is not my story, but somebody else's story with God. It gives you different questions because art is always a response to some kind of a question something that they are asking, something that they are um, wondering about, something that is bugging them. Perspectives, because then people interpret those questions differently. They try to offer different solutions to those questions. That is all an insight, not only into mankind, but also into mankind that God is currently actively trying to engage with. And experiences. It helps us understand the broad set and network of stories because each and every human has a story with God. Each and every human, even the story of constant refusal to engage with God in God's initiative it is still a story with God. It just has a different ending from a different story. So as such, engaging with a place where people go to figure things out, to express their utmost, the deepest, should offer us also a broadened sense of God's work. And I have to put a kind of a disclaimer here, or not like an asterisk there, because this is often how we approach it. We do approach it when we talk about how to formulate ourselves in a way that is that sells best, you know. And then we kind of go, oh, let's see what people are doing. Oh, this is what is currently in. This is our way in. So that now we can package God in a way or uh, not even God, but package. Why do we even need to package God? We, pa we can package our message in a way that would kind of like um, get past their filters, you know, um, would fool their um, defensive structures, so to say, would be camouflaged sufficiently so that they would actually get to it. And then maybe when they unpack it, this something will happen. 
this is the place where we have engaged with the arts. Um, it's, you know, it's the it's the cover design of our books so that people wouldn't throw them in the bin immediately, but would open them first. There's a question. Um, Linda, do we do questions now? Do we? Uh, well, when you conclude your presentation, okay. we will have Take your time. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, ultimately, what we're talking about is that art can be a space for revelations. It is a, re a space for revelations about the reader. And that should always be my first concern. What does it tell me about me? Why do I think that this particular piece is nonsense? Why do I think that it's blasphemous? Why do I, what is it that bugs me about this piece? That is more a question about me than about that piece of art, right? Um, especially when we get uh, moved, when we get moved, it's easier to identify. When we get irritated, um, then it's harder because we need to dwell in a place that is not necessarily immediately pleasant. It is a space of revelations about the author. What moved them? What moved the people who created this? What moved the society who created this, who caused this to have been created? What moved the people who are consuming it? Why is this currently in the museums and why do people feel like it resonates with them so that they pay, pay the ticket price and they actually go and see it? What, what moves the critic? of a piece of art. And ultimately then, because everyone's stories are ultimately a story with God, what does it reveal us about the one who pokes? Who pokes the reader? Who pokes the author? What does it reveal us about the divine and the relationship of the divine with human? What arts? And you might say, ah, this is just the second question. The two other questions are quicker. We've laid the foundation. Here, I wanted to actually throw out a bunch of questions that we can discuss a bit later, but none of those questions are simple. What is art? Was that piece by the chimpanzee art? What makes a piece of art art? Is the painting or the picture that you preserve for the rest of your days of uh, your two-year-old daughter, um, like the scribbles of your two-year-old daughter, is that art? Is a uh, is a pile of poo in the middle of a, in the middle of a museum hall art? Then the question of the relationship between art and beauty: Is everything that is art also beautiful? Is everything beautiful art? The definition of beauty in itself is a tricky one. And you can go and ask the romantics about this one who introduced the concept of the ugly sublime that was supposed to challenge the concept of pretty arts, like pleasing beauty. They would also consider that a desolate landscape in horrible winds can also be beautiful because it is awesome, because it is all evoking. What is good art? And now, of course, the question of good in itself becomes a matter of, you know, ethics and morals and and uh, and technical quality or um, content and all of those things. I think we too often discuss our responses to different forms of art. And you can just see that when you look at the discussions about music in church and in relation to our theological, spiritual spaces. We discuss it too often without actually asking those questions first and realizing the complexity of what we are talking about when we actually discuss any of the concrete manifestations of an artifact or, a, or an artistic production. Then I would like to throw out the, the idea that we are comfortable to a degree with certain appropriate and undisturbing arts in the church. We use them as uh, art is supposed to mimic, uh, art is supposed to explain, right? We have those wonderful pictures of the, um, of the, of the beasts. Uh, somebody has written them down, somebody's like this 
clearly calls for revisualization. So it's an explanatory chart uh, of the end of times or of the of the um, of the you know Daniel Revelation seminars. Um, we are happy with uh, pictures of the nature because they are pretty. Um, we are happy with arts that are undisturbing. I want to throw a parallel to that, where I think uh, we are also really much more happy with appealing to dignity rather than integrity. And what I mean here is that appropriate and undisturbing arts enable us to not engage with the troubling bits, enable us to stay comfortable in those spaces. And now this is especially true when we talk about both personal spiritual journeys, but also our collective spiritual journeys. Um, it might even be OK for us to lose our dignity and be undignified. Um, David dancing rings a bell. That's literally the word that he used. I will be, you know, undignified again. I will uh, I will embarrass myself again and again by being by by preserving my integrity, my 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 genuine response to God. But pieces of art or spaces that would trouble us um, don't guarantee our dignity in those situations. And we feel deeply uncomfortable with spaces that challenge our seeming dignity. Um, and I wonder if there's maybe a connection to the arts in that sense. The truth is that any artist would tell you that true art is always on the border of the comfortable and the uncomfortable. It's always there to tackle the questions on the forefront, not the questions of yesterday that nobody cares about anymore. They are actually there figuring out the questions that are inspired for the present truth. They are actually answering, trying to, attempting to figure out the bits that are currently relevant. So in some ways, wrestling way ahead of us, whether successfully or not, is a different question, but it should not be dismissed. They are always testing boundaries. They are always pushing the borders and testing the limits. They are always asking those questions. Those questions might not be answered the right way, but there is value in figuring out what they are wrestling with because it reveals to us their stories with God and gives us an insight into where God is at work. Then there's the question of the offensive something that is ugly, blasphemous, taboo, or something that is offensive purely because they are pointless, because they are lowbrow, because they are because they are beneath me. You know, uh, the moment that we consider somebody else's considerations and passions beneath me already tells us how we relate to those humans. So these are just questions I want to throw out there. What does it mean that something is ugly? Why is something blasphemous? And why, what exactly about that blasphemy, bless, bless, about the blasphemous bugs me? Um, why is something taboo and why it bugs me? Why does it not bug them? Does it bug my neighbor? Uh, and what do I do with the stuff that is pointless? Like some people would say comic books are not art. Um, well, the, the recent releases of movies, not art. Um, let's take the mirrors and figure that one out first. And then there might be something that God is trying to tell us in that discussion, in the face of an otherwise pointless piece of creation. Lastly, how? I believe that the key lies in um, releasing our grip. I believe that we are so anxious about getting it right, that we need to control the spaces for ourselves and for others in which they meet God. We need to control the spaces and the faces that God can have for me and for others in fear that we get something wrong. And that in itself tells us something about our picture of God. 
it tells us something about the idea that we believe that we have a God that you need to fear when you get something wrong, even if the search is honest. Secondly, if you want to engage with arts, you need to be aware of what is out there. It would need to kind of bring along an intentional engagement with the development of art literacy. Because as we are the people of the word, we, are, we take such pride in our detailed knowledge of hermeneutics and the approaches of how you read and how you don't read. Why do we not engage the same way with other forms of human and potentially divine expression? Again, divine link back to the uh, sanctuary. We need to have an attitude of patience with ourselves, with others, and with the people around us. And we need to apply a principle of humility, grace, and empathy. And I believe great things can happen in that space when we step into it with courage and humility. I'm going to leave with you later a couple of links that you can access. And uh, the exercise that I usually encourage people to start with is expose yourself to that piece of art and ask yourself, what are your impressions, positive or negative? What are your revelations that come from that impression? Because after the impression, you always ask, so why did it do that to me? And you do it with God and you help God figure, help you, you let God, God help you figure it out. And then you ask, what are the implications? Is there some, is, does it make a difference to my life, to my theology, to my outlook on life, um, to anything else? Here's a piece um, by Jacob Collier. Uh, he Won't Hold You, a British contemporary musician, um, combined with a wonderful uh, animation made by, made by an artist. So you can bring that one on board. Um, here's, if you want to do something with a bit more um, edgy, then uh, here's an example of a massive, massive painting. If you see that, um, it's, it takes up an entire wall and most uh, museums cannot display this piece. It's Anselm Kiefer, it's a contemporary German artist, um, mixed media, and this particular one is called um, The Seven Seals, The, the Secret... Um, revelation of John. Um, there's something to engage with if you want. This uh, this takes sitting in front of for a little bit and then you can ask yourself what on earth was that and where did it take me? Or lastly, one of the paintings, uh, one of the pictures that I've been using today, Pieces of, is, a, is, a, is actually a book in the form of a uh, book in the form of a novel but has beautiful contemporary um, illustrations by Rebecca Dautromé, a, a French, renowned French illustrator. Um, as you can see, this is an interesting rendition of Moses's basket. Um, but this picture here is uh, actually the pages that illustrate the story of uh, John the Baptist and what that piece of art has done, what is it responding to what is it doing to the story of John the Baptist, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Well, Miss Kert, uh, I think that it's been mentioned in the chat and it's probably crossed the minds of many of us during your presentation that while you may choose to use a disclaimer that you are not a theologian. You have been speaking to us today about theology. We, we feel the depth of that in your remarks very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to, we'll have more to say, their hands up. So I'm gonna go directly to them. And Harry, I'm coming to you first. You've had something on your mind for, for quite a while. So share your thoughts with us, please. Thank you, Linda. And is it Carrot? Yes, thank sure. you. Thank, thank you, thank you for this talk. Um, you raised the question um, in your in your presentation. Do you venture a definition for art, or is one required for your thesis? <laughs> yeah, I don't think. I thank you for the other half because I don't think it is required in that sense because in some ways you could expand what we've been talking about today to anything outside 
um, to anything anything other, anything else, anything there. Um, but I do believe that there is a, uh, there is a level of also intentionality in some ways or a level of, or a certain type of engagement that the genre that people perceive as art also invites them to do. It's almost like people turn to it as art because it has already been framed as a space where you make sense of things this is the space where you rebel this is the space where you so in some in some ways kind of having a signifier to to talk about those things is still helpful but it is not necessarily essential um and i actually uh, i am because of my background also in in humanities i uh, i I love spaces where something can simultaneously mean different things, which is not something necessarily that people would embrace in uh, in theological discussions, especially in our circles. You have to pin it. Um, and I'm just like, no, it can be all these fluid things at the same time, and we can still talk about it. It's still possible. Um, did you have something in mind, Harry? Would you have something to bring well, to the table? In your, in I, I, I didn't until you started to give your response. And what I'm about to say, I've never heard said elsewhere, but I'm sure it's been said a million times. It occurs to me that art, art may be a form of dreaming, um, except in the sense that there's no marketplace for dreams. Yes. Um, it's hard for them to be retained in the way that a work of art is. But even like art, dreams are often sur subject or, or subject to or desired that they be interpreted yes and so um i don't know maybe art is the thing we have closest to dreaming yes um, and it has in, been said in, in psychoanalytic theories about art because they they would see dreams as a similar type of space that is in between and kind of pulls uh pulls from these from, from the conscious and the subconscious at the same time and then somehow mixes it together and then and it's not a place where you necessarily have to say things about the world around you but it's definitely a space where you resonate with certain things or it's a depiction of the way that certain things resonate inside of you um so yeah but the, but the entire discussion of dreaming and then there's a you, you could also approach it from the angle of communication um i like the idea of signification it's an attempt at signifying something meaningfully um, it doesn't always have to be that you do it for somebody else. It might also be signification for yourself, but it is an idea of it's it's a getting something out of you. And that something might be verbalizable and it might not be verbalizable, um, but getting a concept, getting a feeling, getting uh, something out of you. Uh, and obviously you could be really sick and vomit and that does not necessarily it did come out of you and it was urgent and all of those things and i would not necessarily consider that a piece of art um so it has its limitations but it's one of those that people don't know how to define and if you read textbooks on the study of aesthetics then you realize that the people who are professionals in the field struggle with that um but we all know that it's there it exists like but... a dream yeah like a dream like a dream, like a dream. I could dream you having a hard time recalling. Yes. Just out of reach. Is, is there time for me to ask one more question? It, yes, you seem to do a good job, Harry, of, of conceptualizing your thoughts into concise words. So yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. And I'm so glad that Kareth made the um, comment about music, uh, that being an area of contention, it seems always artistic contention within certainly the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm I'm prompted to recall almost exactly a decade ago the controversy over the film, the record keeper, which mm. was uh, a post, supposedly an interpretation of events, uh, events which precede the biblical narrative. Um, I, I was wondering what obstacle or difficulty prompted you to make this talk. Oh. Um, yes, I think uh, edgewise, my entry point is uh, is music, uh, but also because whenever I go, whenever I go anywhere and talk about worship, because this is something that I've been passionately also talking about, then uh, 
then the assumption that it is only linked to uh, to music uh, has always frustrated me. Even though I am a singer and I love music and it is one of my, you know, it's my one of my key love languages. Um, it, I've always felt that it is so deeply discriminatory. And also, even within the realm of music, we are so comfortable with uh, with logocentric music. So music that has concrete lyrics that tells us concretely what we're supposed to think about. It tells us propositionally what this song is about, and it and we can measure it in terms of the 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 kind of like the soundness of its theology. Um, and instrumental music is already something that gets us kind of like, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Uh, we turn to our phones, we turn to our neighbors, or we're happy if the instrumental music is of a song that we can hum to uh, with lyrics in our heads, because then we know what to do with that space. But in general, we as a community get lost when it comes to spaces that are not tightly verbally curated. And and that's always been bugging me because that also means that the type of poetry that we can engage with is very limited. It cannot challenge. It has to be reassuring. Um, the the forms that we engage with, the genres, the you know, all of it has to be reassuring, uh, because heaven forbid we lose control over what people think, and people we because we don't have a culture of engaging with that type of. Um, with a freer space for interpretation, then people do actually get lost. There's panic in the in the hall when you when you leave them with that space. It's like, what are we supposed to do? Did they miss something? Did something go wrong? No, this is a place for interpretation and bringing your own meaning and engaging with the divine where you are at. And we don't have that literacy. And I think that's where where it comes from. And I would say, seconding what you've just said, just before I let you go to other questioners. Cor in, in a correlative manner, um, in the visual arts, what we look for are representations that are literal yes. and um, non-abstract. As you were speaking, I began to wonder, can all forms or schools of artistic visual interpretation be applied religiously? We have figurative religious art, but could we have a piece of religious conceptual art, for example, or um, abstract art? And these are questions that um, are hard to answer if 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 uh, congregations rely on the literal and the specific to guide them through religious experience. Yes. So thank you, thank you for that yes. for that uh, those answers and for your yeah. presentation. Oh, pleasure. Thank you for your questions. We really need like we feel like to be doing our spirituality and our religion right. We need to be verbally explicit and propositionally correct and those are the things that we need and if we are not ticking those boxes then we are not doing spirituality right um whereas uh, for example the record keeper you would be assessing this based on the accuracy or the correspondence to reality but an, a piece of art is not supposed to be always mimicking you know it, it, not everything has to be hyper realism it doesn't have to correspond in each detail to reality as we see it it can have so many other points that are no less true about the state of human beings about theology about god about our experiences um but we get anxious there because it is not as strictly uh, mappable you know i think that uh care to your your presentation has been so provocative that it's it's raising many thoughts and questions and it would occur to me too that i think that that certainly myself i feel like you have given us permission uh to think and perhaps react in ways that we hadn't known or thought uh we had permission to do but let me come to chris who is a dreamer as well and chris what's what's on your mind today well, I I enjoyed the presentation as well. I really credit art with with really healing my heart as I left pastoral ministry a number of years ago. I started doing art as play in my own little home studio. Um, I think where theology and art, and you've just been touching on it, as does uh, has David Barrett in his more recent um, comments in the chat. The problem with theology is theology and Adventism stresses rightness of belief as opposed to belief in anything that is wrong or or in error 
And I see this a lot in the church when, you know, they might be watching a Bible video uh, on the life of Jesus, let's say, and something occurs that is not in their understanding of the Bible. They throw out the whole baby with the bathwater. Well, that's a bad movie. You can't watch that one. Um, and art cannot be nailed down like that. It cannot be controlled unless you have a committee that is making the art, which art by committee is almost an oxymoron. <laughs> um, this presentation brings to mind one of my favorite songs by Harry Chapin called Flowers Are Red. And I would invite you to uh, YouTube that or Google that. It's about a little boy who's painting flowers at school and and he sees flowers, all these different colors. And so he's painting red and yellow. And the teacher comes along and says, flowers are red and green leaves are green. There's no need to see flowers any other way than the way they always have been seen. So the little boy starts painting flowers the way his teacher has told him they are. And it, and it just squashes his spirit. And so he, he starts to only paint flowers red and green. And uh, it just uh, is a very sad song at that level. Um, and uh, I will post a link to that song uh, on you on the chat here in a little bit. But those are just a couple of my observations, maybe a comment on that carrot. Um, art is uncontrollable, and the church wants to control its theology and its perceptions of things. I mean, I don't know a whole lot why that video mentioned was canned. It was just canceled. A lot of money went into that video, and then it was just deep-sixed, un uh, unreleased. And uh, I think that's why art and religion have a hard time in uh, fundamentalist churches, because you have to make sure the art is controlled correctly. Yes. I think the question of control is mighty, but but also it links to the idea that we assume it just reveals what we assume about humans and what we assume about God. We assume that there is no way that God can access any human beyond my propositional understanding um, and that we also don't trust humans and we don't trust God to do their job properly if I release my grip. And that is a that is a that is ultimately horrible arrogance. We've all heard of the, the artist commission that once they get all done with the art and it's in place and unveiled, people gasp and go, oh, that's scandalous. It needs to be taken down. Well, you know, what did you <laughs> what did you expect when you asked certain artists to do certain artworks? Art mm -hmm. cannot be controlled like that. No. But art is, art, therefore. The ugliness of art, the beauty of art, both help to cause us to be arrested and to then answer those questions about reality and ourselves and others. And they help us become better people, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I would just, again, add on to that briefly, Chris. I, I made a note myself. I, it was in the chat. Someone was responding to the presentation and said, let him who has ears to hear and 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 I think what went along with that is that we were being invited, in essence, to interpret. And and I think that Chris is right. We've we those of us who've grown up in in a fundamental religious household and schools have not felt that we were free to interpret. Mm -hmm. Which is why I especially loved on one of your slides you said release our grip. <laughs> if we release our grip, then it it gives us permission, perhaps to interpret in a way that we might not have thought of before. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, let me come to my dear friend, Jerry Lofthouse. Jerry, what's on your mind today? Oh, lots of things, but um, Ms. Lazich, I appreciate your releasing some of the creativity within all of us in your presentation. Um, I particularly enjoyed the little dig that art perhaps should never be mimically. And I think that that's one of the things that Linda was just referring to is that fundamental art seems to have been tied into mimicry. But I really wanted to question what we ourselves may do with art because you asked that fundamental question early on in the presentation. 
what will you do with it? And I think you meant it to be as an artist. But I want to turn that and a bit and say, what can I do with it as a recipient of art? And that made me think of the ultimate creator. And I, that's my God. Do I do wrong in insisting that his creation, his art, only be utilized in one certain way? Or should he be perceived more like the chimpanzee and leaving his creation as something that should be seen as plastic and adaptable and never done right? Am I going too far? No, I don't think I don't think you are, obviously. But it is uh it is I, I did have that dual thing in mind in that sense. Yes. Yeah, so what do we what does one do when one is an artist? What does one do when one is the recipient of art uh, or the viewer or the audience or all of those or the participator ultimately of, of the participator in the act of meaning making ultimately? And yes, then the the wonderful question, what do we do with with God's art? Thank you for that one. I think that's you know, I, I have to I have to confess that I had a terrifying moment. Kert, when you asked, well, it was Lauren who responded to your request and suggested that people post in the chat their reactions to the original work that you put up. And my terror was is that everyone was afraid that it was a piece of your own artwork. And we <laughs> <That> would... <laughs> <laughs> and we'd be afraid, afraid to offer any real uh, response to it for fear of seeming, uh, you know, improper in any way. You might want to mention that in the future presentation, that it's yeah. not yours. <laughs> to take the edge of anxiety off. Yes, thank you. I didn't even, that did not even occur to me. But yes, that, that's a useful tip. Oh. Once again, going to our inherent fear of interpretation. I mean, yes. shouldn't we felt free to interpret even if we had thought it was yours? Yes. So I, I speak to my my own hardwired repression. <laughs> and I was so relieved then to begin to see the chat, things come up on the chat. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, I'm gonna come, thanks, thanks, Jerry. Thank you for yours. Uh, Carmen, uh, I'm, asking you to unmute and okay. anxious to hear what what your thoughts are this afternoon uh first i want to thank you is it kurt yeah, kurt? Kurt. Mm -hmm. kurt? kurt i respond to anything i've been uh, i've been living in the in england for 10 years now it's it's whatever you call me but bianca say it again say it again sorry Say your name again. Kart. It's quite Kart. sharp. Yes, Kart. thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. This was so exciting and thought provoking. Thank you so much. I'm going to be reflecting on it for a long time and going over some of the screenshots of your questions. Um, one of the things I kept thinking of all along was, and that you spoke to so well about uh, in religion, because especially I think in my context, in my life, Adventist attempts at art is really illustration rather than art. And that it does away with all the questions. Mm. Um, and I was just gonna bring up in sculpture, what a difference that can be on one side, a not Adventist sculpture like Krista, the Krista, it's the, the female Christ on the cross that raises, at first it's shocking, and then it raises all sorts of internal questions about what the incarnation means. And then the, the sculpture we usually get in Adventism, like at the General Conference building, where they have the people in, all in bronze in their native costumes, kind of starting to being lifted up in the resurrection at the second coming. Or at Loma Linda University on the campus, they have Ellen White on a horse-drawn cart saying, this is the place, you know, when she picked. They're, they don't leave 
any questions. It's illustration of something very concrete and that doesn't go any farther than anything written about those events as we accept them to be truth. Mm. Not sure I have a question. It just, your talk reminded me of in sculpture, yeah. particularly what I've seen. And it is, it is exactly, it's, a, it's art that is the answer, not art that is the question. Not, it's not, it's, it doesn't ask. Um, whereas when you, when you mentioned the illustration, I know what you meant, but, oh, but that same, uh, but that same, uh, that same book, which I can't read because it's in French. Uh, it was written in French, but I got it because it has such amazing illustrations. Uh, these are illustrations that actually give you apologies. Now, is there anyone who's uncomfortable with nudity straight in your face? Uh, but this is, uh, this is Eve. Um, and the questions of uh, of race and representation. So what has happened here is that Eve and Adam both have been stripped of any kind of racial or ethnic kind of uh, of markers. They have been created stripy um, to to illustrate kind of the origin of humankind. And this is this is now something that some people would also find disturbing because it doesn't look like the one that we were supposed to have from the you know the the felt pictures for the for the children's uh, bible lessons or sabbath school um um i i would or yes so i would really recommend for example looking into uh looking into these options and those those characters travel uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds in different stories um so just an illustration of an illustration that is officially illustration but still manages to ask questions and to and to poke a little bit oh excellent thank you thank you carmen patty while i'm coming to you and i've asked you to unmute i just wanted to affirm something you mentioned before the group had uh formally uh come to to meeting and that is once one has a really good professional headshot done one never redoes it because nothing ever improves going forward so welcome to you <laughs> i know you would not <laughs> gravity is not kind to any of us but welcome patty we're glad you're here what's what are you thinking what questions or thoughts do you have um well i just really enjoyed this um presentation and it far exceeded what I was expecting. Um, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but you just blew it out of the water. I mean, it just really, really, really. And because of that, because of your passion for art, it occurred to me, I'm very curious, what kind of art do you have in your home? What kinds of things do you choose uh, to surround yourself with that you love so much that you have in your home? Mm -hmm um yes well first of all thank you so much and i think uh, you said passion for passion for art and i think that that is entirely true and i'm i ah this is i'm going to risk sounding really um i don't even know what the word is here these are not words that i usually put in the way that i'm going to put them but i think it's really important to actually emphasize this it is actually a passion for god that manifests itself in a holistic, a truly holistic approach to who human, who humans have been uh, created to be. And I know that that was far from being your question. And I know, I know how how that was. I was just thinking about it that it is very often actually framed in a way. It's almost like framed as a kind of like a side, as a side project. But it can't be a side project if this is how we have been created, and if we have been created in a way in which this is so deeply meaningful to us like how often does it happen to you that uh, a theological that you read the fundamental <clears throat> truths and a tear comes to your eye it might happen you know it might it might for other reasons as well but but what but but then you we are created to sit in a, a landscape of sounds and be moved and uh, and to stand in front of something that just uh, overwhelms us with the beauty or the message or an emotion or something and this is not the result of sin this is something that god created us to be 
And as such, if we neglect that side of us, we are neglecting a side of God's communication with us and of God making God's self meaningful in a way that truly can move us. But then coming back to those pieces of, I am not uh, super edgy when it comes to uh, when it comes to art. I appreciate it, but I don't live in uh, very edgy contemporary art. What I do love is illustration. And uh, what my husband, who is also here, so I can actually talk about him, he can defend himself, but uh, he's just, he's appeared among us. Um, what he would, he would call them children's books because they have pictures, which in itself already tells you what a contemporary systematician thinks of visual arts. There's a stab. Um, but, uh, but the fact that they have, they have illustrations usually makes things children's books, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I have a lot of books that might even be children's books, but my children are not allowed to touch um, <laughs> be because, because I want to keep them uh, sacred and clean <laughs> and intact. Um, or if we do touch them, then we all have our rounds of hand washing and then we come and sit together and I turn the pages. Um, and music wise, uh, music wise, I grew up uh, doing a lot of different, different styles. Um, different different styles i this was our family activity that we we used to buy the season's tickets at the beginning of the season and then uh, this was something that we did we went into the into sound spaces and experienced those together and uh, and i still love classical music i love jazz i love blues i love i love country music i love there's so much it just uh, it just gets to me there are a few that i have to appreciate from a distance. Thank you very thank much. <laughs> yes, and thank you for your question, Patty. <coughs> David, I've been intrigued by your posts in the chat, so I'm interested to hear what you want to say to the group at large and to our speaker. Thanks. Yeah, um, I wanted to say thank you for a great presentation. I have a humanities background, so this is the questions of interpretation meaning are just I, I could talk about that forever. Um, where I what I thought about with this is for me, I mean, art is so close to play. Um, it is this just exploration and creativity mm -hmm. and engagement. Um, and part of what I thought about, I, I two things I was saying. Well, one of them just came up, but I guess I'm curious about how you think about that relation. Um, the, the one story I was thinking of is I remember playing Pictionary with a bunch of Adventists um, and an older person in the group was having real trouble. Like they had the, the picture had to be perfect. And it didn't matter how long it took. And so they because they were so focused on this perfection in the picture, this perfect representation, they couldn't play. Mm -hmm. um, but then with what you were just saying, I was also thinking about how often heaven is figured as being the end of play we're going to get to heaven god's going to tell us everything and we're just going to sing songs and pray or something for all of eternity and play is going to basically play is going to be no more because mm. it is not part of who we were made to be by extension and we never say that but so i'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on this well, you can always do ring around the roses or something harmless like that. Um, but <laughs> but I do think that there is a but that actually you should do the next presentation at one point about play, because I think that is also a really um, misunderstood category or genre. Um, it is of, also often seen as as empty entertainment or it is seen as um, as just a way for children, let's say, to practice mimicking. Uh, being a proper a proper adult, you know, um, and we fly in precisely with those same things. Even in in those, uh, what was that piece? The the flowers are red. Earlier touches on the same thing. It's kind of like do it properly, do it do it neatly, right? And uh, and the question of general idea of creativity in play uh, is mm -hmm. is something that I've been thinking about a lot, even in relation to the material that I can share with my children, because there there is a bit of that, but it is but it is Mm -hmm. It is really that the proportions are underwhelming when it comes to to genuine play. My sister is a special educator, and she actually has to teach kindergarten teachers to play, 
Um, she gives training sessions to play with them because they are used to teaching. So it's something, it's another human quality that I think really needs to be opened up and uh, and cherished to its fullest. Thank you for that parallel. I really like that. And yes, I believe that they are connected. Thank you. But please go for that seminar and then I'll definitely show up. <laughs> That's up to Lauren. Thank you, David. Lauren. Oh, actually, may I? I am so sorry. May I come back to that one? And this is now something. Um, Dihi, where are you? Are you still here? Uh, sorry. Yes, I'm he is. is. is my husband, no, no, no. Like my husband. Is my husband still here? He oh. teaches in... This is where my theology knowledge now comes from. It's all secondhand. Um, uh, he teaches about the idea of um of the way that we're supposed to actually do our our story with god as a type of play but now in terms of drama but not only in terms of drama that nothing nothing of it has been nothing of it has been predetermined and nothing there is also the relationship between uh, the the human agent and god then and the divine is not necessarily the human agent trying to figure out what exactly is the script that I'm supposed to now walk that God has already prepared for me? But actually, um, that there is this theory that actually it is more of an inter interpretation. It is a free interpretation of a continuation of a story, which then links to that idea of play. It is a play, like Shakespearean type of drama. You know what has gone on before. You know, and this is applying to individual and communally. You know what what the generations before have done. You know the bits of revelation that has have been given to you. But now you're supposed to be writing that script in collaboration. Um, as a form of play, as a, as a kind of like an interpretation, free interpretation within the genre, with consistency and faithfulness to the to the story as it has already happened, but with creativity that God has freely given you because we have been created in God's image. So in that sense, that links back to what you what you said. And I'm sorry that it came to me with a delay. Sorry. No, that's good. Excellent. Thank you. Lauren, show your thoughts, please. That's okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I chatted with Tihi a little bit ago, but he seems to have slipped away. I would have liked you to, to interact with him. Oh, yeah. When he reappears, then. <clears throat> By the way, I have invited him to also come and talk. Uh, we've been looking for a class on ecclesiology, and that's uh, something that Tihi does very well. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. He's looking for a date. I, I confess, Kart, when I listen to you, this kind of discussion makes certain sort of very cognitive German people like me get a little, a little confused and feel, feel a little stupid. <laughs> because there's certain ones of us who feel the need to always be able to express something in words. Mm. And I and I feel very insecure with art. I love it. I, I go looking for it and I, I go to to uh, art museums whenever we're traveling. But I don't know how to talk about it. And somehow that seems important to be able to talk about it, to describe it, to say, mm. Oh, that looks like a horse, <laughs> or that looks like a something, mm -hmm. and uh, that that I struggle with that. And you, you guys, you guys have already kind of gotten into this idea that uh, we come from a very, a very Yankee practical sort of religion. Uh, I mean, just think about this: our our church founders, when they decided to start a church. They didn't adopt an aesthetic name. They adopted a very practical name. Okay, let's call ourselves the two things that we believe in the strongest right at this moment. The seventh day and the second coming of Christ. There we go. We got it. Very Yankee. Very, very New England. Very practical. And uh, a lot of us who either were drawn to this religion or fell into it never really thought much beyond that. And I have to confess, that's a, that's a weakness of mine. I love looking at art. 
but I don't know how to talk about it. And because I don't know how to talk about it, it sometimes makes me feel a little anxious. And uh, I had a I, I had a church member when I was in the Bay Area of California who was an extraordinarily successful abstract artist. This is the kind of person who sold canvases to Silicon Valley firms for ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a crack. They were gorgeous. They were gem-like. They were, uh, you know, layered and and collaged and and uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And I remember one time trying to have a conversation with him about what his art meant. It was very frustrating because he had a hard time saying that it meant something. It, it, I looked at it and said, that looks like horses riding. And he'd say, yeah, I don't know. That's not, it just doesn't mean that to me. It just is something pretty. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still struggling with that. I, I find myself, like my wife said, probably seeing things more as I, I, I guess it's stuff that's sort of on the edge of illustration that is very meaningful to me. And sometimes I'll, I'll share one with you here that uh, I like a lot. I don't know if you know Henry Oswa Tanner, um, African-American. This is his Annunciation. Now, this, this was theologically meaningful to me when I saw it, because I'm thinking of this as opposed to the medieval pictures where where the angel appears to Mary uh, like looking like an angel and, and uh, holding a flower or a lily or something, I thought, this is a kind of terrifying thing I could actually imagine Mary seeing in the Annunciation. Um, I, I like this picture so much, I actually went to Philadelphia and uh, saw it in person and it was uh, stunning but the 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 more abstract things i want to be able to describe somehow or talk about somehow mm. and i'm not sure i'm able to mm. does that make sense it does make sense and then there are these uh the the follow-up questions to that is that is is it necessarily is it necessary to talk about art, right? And and that actually does link to this general idea that if we can't kind of, uh, I don't know if it's the right word, it's going to be violent now, and I don't think that's always the intention, but if we can't impose something that makes sense, like a description on it or a, or an interpretation on it, then that that is somehow less, uh, less meaningful or less significant or, or less valuable right? Uh, or somehow that this experience is in any way less real. Um, the second question then is, um, we we might be able to talk about it. And I, th I don't, I don't think that arts should be normative either. If that makes sense, I think to each our own, <laughs> we are made to believe but to, to be and to perceive and to make sense of the world differently. And it might be, Lauren, that there's something to be developed there, a skill that could open up to you. It might be that that's just never supposed to. It was never supposed to be the place where you where you burn, you know, where your insides light up. And that is perfectly fine. It's just um, you would also be sitting here and fully acknowledging that that your experience and your anxieties are not supposed to be normative or don't necessarily uh, coincide or pre describe identify the boundaries of what is divine and what is demonic or mm -hmm. what is essential and what is uh, what is completely irrelevant so i think that communally we just need to accept that to a much larger degree but it doesn't have to mean that all of us have to be engaging it with it with the same passion and with the same sense of 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 freedom and um and excitement yeah, so there's kind of I I don't know where in that uh, in that link of questions is the place where you feel like you need to d diverge, and maybe that's something to then actually explore. Is it about literacy? Is it about something that needs to be unlocked? Is it about just this not being my thing? Well, actually, I I, I love art museums a great deal. I just get very uncomfortable when we try to talk about it because. Yeah. 
and, and I begin to understand that as a pastor, see. Uh, and as a pastor, I remember showing people a, a piece of art on the screen. And people, I used, to, I used to grab pieces of art and put them on the screen, on the PowerPoint to illustrate my sermon. And had people very angry. How mm. could you show Jesus looking like that? Jesus didn't. I, I remember using <coughs> a Korean artist who I'd pull off and put pictures, and they were they were very illustrative, but they they were still not typical mm -hmm. uh, pictures of Jesus. That it, it was not Solomon's head of Christ. It was not uh, uh, Harry Anderson pictures. And uh, I actually had a lady who got so upset she she would take pictures of them and send them to the conference office and say, look at what our pastor showed us, uh, you know, and I, I learned to be very careful. I, I quit using pictures of, of Eve without her top on, even though that's what the Bible said she looked like, because that would generate problems. Mm -hmm. And I begin to understand how we fundamentalists, we are extremely uncomfortable with anything that's abstract or uncertain. We want to we want to keep it within a sort of cultural framework. It has it, to be accurate. It has to well accurate as I see it. Yes, yeah, uh, yes, obviously. <laughs> obviously and, to that. What else? Because I see it right. But I wanted to say about the about the kind of like the impulse to talk about it. Um, we don't have that impulse. It, we have that impulse most of the time. But one of the places where we don't, and I think that this is just an illustration of how it maybe should be in other places too, is when we uh, we are in uh, in a house of mourning and we know that words just cannot do justice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then we have that respect. We have that respect for the pain and for the impossibility of adequately representing that pain or even addressing that pain with words and we know that there are moments when you just have to put your hand on somebody's shoulder and that is it there is there is nothing that you can do with words that could replace that magnify that or even adequately represent the meaning of what you've just done non-verbally and i think that in some ways art can do a similar thing to us it can be that hand on our shoulder which means everything but can never be put into words and should like we all know those moments when we've messed it up by thinking that we now need to put something in words and we've said something that has been nice and neat but completely and utterly inappropriate in that situation and yes. i think that so the impulse to verbalize doesn't always need to be there at all and uh and thus the uh <laughs> of the uh i can't remember her name the bulgarian the feminist uh, uh theologian there and and uh psych psychiatrist that you're talking that you're, you're, Julia Kristeva. yeah mm -hmm. yes that where she she uses the picture of the dead christ and you you get a bit of that feeling as well when you see the the uh the famous sculpture of of uh mary holding her dead son you know, that's true. And and I, I wonder why I, I wonder why we are that way. I, I struggle with that. But thank you. This has just been so amazingly marvelous. And thank you so much for you've stretched my mind a lot today. So glad I thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. Um we're gonna come to Justin in just a moment. Justin, I'm gonna ask you to unmute, but before you do that. Uh, well, go ahead and unmute. I was just going to say, you know, Lauren, we're, we're just not taught much or encouraged to think outside the box. Uh, you know, we expect things to be right. Uh, years ago, I worked with teachers uh, in a public school environment, and I had a wonderful resource, a book entitled Teaching as a Subversive Activity. And there was one little story in this book that illustrates, I think, this concept. There was a young man, a student in high school, and he was the last kid sitting taking the final exam in the physics class. 
And the professor came over to him and he said, I don't understand what your problem is. You're smart. This is really, this should not be hard for you. Why, why are you sitting here? Why haven't you completed the test? Look, here's this last question. How do you determine the height of this building? And the professor says, I know you know how to do this. And the student responded by saying, well, I just can't figure out which answer I want to use. And the professor is stunned because he said, well, there's only, there's only one answer to this, only one correct answer. And the student says, well, I just have so many, I, I can't decide. And the professor said, well, give me an example. And the kid says, well, I could find out the height of this building by using a barometer. And the professor says, how would you do that? He said, well, I would, I would go to the basement of the building and I would take the barometer with me and I would say to the janitor, I will give you this fine barometer if you tell me how tall this building is. <laughs> See, it's, it's thinking outside the box. <laughs> There's not just one right answer. And I think Lauren, that's, I think, you know, I'm interested in Lauren's comment that, that his friend or his acquaintance, who is the artist, I, I think Lauren, you were expecting him to talk about his artwork when perhaps he was expecting you to talk about your perception. But given Lauren, I'm, I'm older than you, but given again, our fundamentalist upbringing, we're not, we're not sure about that. What if what we say is wrong or what if what we say offends the person? And so we're, we, we're like, it's like walking on eggshells. We're, we're very, very careful about that. And I, I can appreciate it. So let me come to Justin now. You've been very patient welcome. We're glad to see you. What's, what are you thinking this afternoon? Hey, um, love the discussion. And I guess one of the things that I end up doing, probably my Adventist heritage, um, is needing to judge things. So I think someone earlier was like, is this demonic or divine? Is this essential or like extra? And mm -hmm. I think that's the lens that I look at everything with. So like, even when it comes to talking about art, it's like, well, I want to be right. And I don't, I don't want to do this thing. And I also feel like I have a way of judging feelings that I experience mm, yes. in certain situations. There's like, I might feel anger or pain, but I'm not, I'm supposed to like believe like Jesus, my way out of that. I don't know. Like Jesus is the answer. I don't have to feel pain. Um, yes. And I think that has been hard. And like this past month, I started reading this book called The Artist Way. And in the beginning, they have a couple of things that I want to read that are just really hard for me to actually believe. Like it says, creativity is God's gift to us. Using our creativity is our gift back to God. And part of me is like, I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to believe that. Mm. Um, another thing it says is through the use of my creativity, I serve God. And then in my mind, I'm like, well, it depends what I'm creating, right? Not just tapping into that or using it. Um, my creativity always leads me to truth and love. Um, that's like an affirmation they say. And I'm like, I, I don't believe that one. I think that creativity can go in a bad direction. And I see myself judging it before I even do anything, right? Mm, it's like, mm -hmm. I don't let myself go that far. So I just wonder, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just on this journey and being like, how do I try to step away from the judgment and sort of allow God's creativity to come through me, which is a really hard thing to do because there's a lot of words and Adventism thoughts that say only in these paths are these are approved directions and other directions are not approved. So um yes. More, more to say from there. I resonate with that so much because I think that and that is I think one of the key kind of there is a safety in being brought up in a in a hyper regulated household, so to say, if we talk about our our church, um, there is a clarity that comes with it. I am very passionate about figuring stuff out. I'm very passionate about being detailed and and concrete and and uh, and detailed in the way that we find words to express things, you know, um, precision of expression is is close to my heart and obviously I love talking about things I mean as you've been exposed to um but there is a when you take that level of kind of external regulation and you lift it a bit then you realize how atrophied some of the muscles can actually be underneath and I think one of the muscles that gets really atrophied in that kind of a in that kind of a culture is the culture of personal discernment 
we don't trust we we don't trust our ability to walk with god and to discern uh for ourselves and uh and that makes it almost impossible because we have always been regulating that distinction between right and wrong externally. Something tells us, somebody tells us from the pulpit or the book tells us whether something is right or wrong. And by that creates a very black and white and very, very, um, very, oh, how do I say that? Very, um, very, What's the word? What's the undiverse, um, undiverse situation for us? And then we try to, you know, squeeze ourselves. Uh, and some people fit that mold with more comfort, and some people feel like they're completely being distorted in order to actually fit that. They leave, or they, or they, or they develop serious problems with their spiritual uh, spiritual lives. Um, what it ultimately comes down to is your walk with God, right? And uh, your ability to actually trust yourself, um, to take a step with God and for it not to go in the wrong direction, because you are doing it from a place that is rooted in your relationship. And then you have you have a trust for God and you have trust in yourself in that relationship with God if that makes sense. And I think that it is possible to start going out with a hooray from that and go like, anything is all right. Anything is all right. Nothing is ever going to be evil, right? And that is not true. There is stuff that is evil. I don't know if there are artifacts that are evil, but there are ways in which we can relate to the world that definitely permit evil to be brushing against our or touch against us right i don't know if that makes sense like and i don't believe that it is related to the genre or that it is related to the artifact it is related to my journey and what kind of things i permit to come in even that same piece of art can be outrageously off for one person and a divine experience for another one because of how we position ourselves because where we are coming from because of the cultural baggage of meaning making that we bring to that situation that for some people triggers questions that they are struggling with and and they go in a completely different direction which then is which then is us engaging with the divine or the opposite of the divine, right? So I believe that there are ways of doing things wrong spiritually. And I believe that this can happen in the space of art, but it can just as well happen in the space of expository propositional religion. We can engage to the same degree with what is dangerous. Let us not fool ourselves that somehow if we put those lines in big red, you know, boundaries, we put that put ourselves in there, that somehow then we are safe. We are not. So so it's more about kind of the the idea of developing that that sense of discernment and the ability to then walk our walk with God. And then you don't have to have that anxiety. And then those words at the beginning, if you have that precondition, are true. Because if you do all of, if you do art in your walk with God, then those statements are true. Then even if you mess up and you create a really messy piece, or even if you create a piece that actually communicates pain and anger, it is a way of working through it with God instead of this becoming your trap right and yeah and and just the same way suppressing your feelings is a demonic trap <laughs> it's it's uh, it's not divine working things out is the divine way walking with god is the divine way so i think that there is i fully resonate with what you were saying and that it brings us to the very core of it which is the relationship and the gift that Solomon knew how to ask for, and I think we should all be asking for, and then practicing our steps in that skill and that gift of discernment. And then we can be truly creative without anxiety. You know, I, I Justin, I really appreciate the vulnerability yourself and your inner thoughts that you shared with us today. It obviously has taken us to a new level with Kert's response to it. So I, I thank you for that. Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Clarence, you've heard all the thoughts being shared today. What What is on your mind? 
Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to our host for our guest for the very beautiful presentation. Yeah, um, I've been thinking in the realm of creativity, subjectivity, our personal apprehension of things, nature impresses us all. Are we, would we be prepared to credit the animist with, uh, with genuine, or maybe not genuine, but at least uh, uh, authentic, salvific God consciousness through his personal appreciation of nature. Hmm. Well, I think it and, uh, Yeah, go, proceed, sorry. And to extend that a little, a little further, we Adventists, we, let's say it bluntly, we don't like Roman Catholics, okay? <laughs> well, how do we relate? Could we extend that idea to a Roman Catholic feeling awe and uh, reverence hmm. beside a statue of Jesus Christ, a sculptured statue of Jesus Christ, a work mm -hmm. of art? Mm -hmm. Would we accept that this is a genuine and um, it may be salvific enough in his particular case. <clears throat> Are we willing to do that? Mm. Or would we be going too far? Well, I don't, um, I think that this also boils down to the answer to the previous question, which is the uh, the, the element of discernment. And, uh, and in some ways, I also wonder if it is necessary for us to make any decisions about the author's uh, basically as you said the author's salvation uh in some ways i don't know that it's our you know it's not our place to our decide business. whether whether it is or it isn't what is true is that what they have created or what they have the the spaces that they have created as a response to how they have tried to make sense of the world can be meaningful to us nevertheless yeah. right they can be meaningful to us as a revealer of something about certain questions that can be certain answers that have been answered uh, or, or attempted, right? Or it can also, for me, the greatest thing about art is that you always meet yourself in it and you meet it in a really honest way because it's possible to, it's almost like with words, sometimes it's possible to distance yourself and your reactions uh, in theory, theorizing away, analyzing away, kind of categorizing, you know, um, dissecting very quickly so that we almost cut ourselves away from our natural response to it, right? So we kind of create these layers of buffer and it doesn't touch us because we are so good at it. Um, but then when it comes to music, for example, and stuff, you can just you can just see it. people have way more passionate arguments about music than certain parts of our theology. It's it gets them up in arms you know tears and everything because it touches us more immediately and I think in that sense standing in front of that Catholic statue we can be asking those questions precisely what does this piece of art do to me what does the fact that it's Catholic do to me what does it reveal to me about my relationship with my fellow man what does it really reveal to me about my religious anxieties what does it reveal to me about my picture of how god relates to humans or how god relates to others um why does it bug me that it is in a catholic church what about it bugs me and why you know and when we when we are facing ourselves in that interpretation in that act of encounter um that's where i believe that we should be kind of going god stand next to me and and do the work that you intended for us to do in the presence of that artifact um so it is not even necessarily we're not when it is a spiritual journey with god it doesn't have to be a theologically propositional analysis of a piece right yes. and uh, and sometimes it might also in the implication sections have very concrete results that translate into shifts in our theological outlook, um, theoretical, theological. But I would say, Cla Clarence, that that 
that this the answer to that question depends on the person's personal walk with God. I also feel like, um, as I was saying to Justin, if you push somebody over that edge, they might end up stumbling into stuff that evokes things that are not good, right? If you push somebody saying that this this uh, this animist over here is glorifying God, um, I don't know if they if if they manage to actually hold that piece together in a way that they can live this authentically and purely in their spiritual journey. Um, maybe it's not just a discomfort. Maybe it breaks somebody. Um, and the other way around. I think it's about that space. It's about that permission for people to walk their walk with God that I'm passionate about. Yes, I um, I hear you. And uh, but I've been I've, I've been thinking in the in the context of our working to save souls because that's mm. what our Adventism is all about. Huh? Mm. In that context. Would we discourage or would we encourage or would we integrate? I'm thinking of this, uh, what was his name? The one who cut the great oak somewhere in Europe and okay. scar one of them. Huh? He felt it in order that the people should become Christians because they were worshipping at this oak and he cut it down. Okay. And they became Christians. Well, could he have integrated the whole thing and preach Christ and allow the oak to stand. And what about, you know, mm. in the context of saving souls for heaven? Yes. How do we do that? Yes. I don't know I have an answer myself. No? I it's don't either. Question. And I think that's, Clarence, it is a provocative question. And I think you've given us something to ponder. It is a bit outside the purview of our, our discussion yes, today. Certainly. But I know that you're a deep thinker. That's why you brought it up. I, I feel really embarrassed to say that when you asked your question, I thought about standing in front of the life-size sculpture of a cow carved in butter at the Wisconsin State Fair. And I wouldn't have minded where it was located. It was just a lovely thing to see. <laughs> <coughs> I wanted to actually say- those of us. Oh, sorry. I, I missed you there. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm. Uh, if you wanted to respond to Clarence, please. I did my... a little bit because I do feel that it is com uh, uh, it is really complicated. It boils down to what um, Dr. David Williams at the um, at Andrews calls the web of meaning, and uh, and I love that metaphor for culture ultimately or uh, systems. What I would go like systems of signification, but he has a way more poetic way of talking about it. So a web of meaning and. Uh, and that how true meaning of anything that you encounter actually happens at the touching point of the trigger or in our case then the artifact and you right it it where where those two things touch and what ultimately creates the me meaning is where in your web of meaning it touches and that web of meaning is both personal and is also cultural so it can change through time because of your personal experiences or because of your cultural um, context, your your space, your um, your time, all of those things. And, and that means that some things today can create a meaning that nobody a hundred years from now will experience. And I would, I, I am passionately of that school where, that believes that the meaning in itself is not in that artifact in that sense, but it is in, in that point of contact between the artifact and the interpreter. So the web of meaning. And, um, and it's fascinating how then that realization shapes the way that we if we talk about mission or if we do talk about communication in general how we choose the appropriate ways to communicate things so let's say you wouldn't tattoo a swastika on your forehead and go around and saying that it's a it's a symbol of peace and uh, in central europe these days right because clearly the 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 hindu original symbol has been modified and has been hijacked and the web of meaning that it now touches is the opposite of the original symbol uh, however it was used and um, last just now this summer 
If anyone wants to be confused by those questions, visit Rome with a good tour guide. And you see Rome, which used to be a pagan empire, then, be then became a Christian empire. But the pagan empire also had connections with Egypt and certain portions of Egypt where 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 it's you know it owned them so you have these wonderful obelisks i think 13 or 16 or something of them in dispersed around rome and they are clearly a symbol of conquering right they are clearly originally uh very pagan uh, because it's the Egyptian religions, whatever you have, all those hieroglyphic material up there, which is which is pagan. Then you have the pagan conquerors who took those uh, who took those. So it's the second layer of pagan, the Roman pagan empire. And then you have a cross, a metal cross that has been installed on top of it when Rome became a Christian empire. And you're looking at this thing and you're going like, what am I supposed to make of this? Because the layers of the web of meaning are just so multi-layered and you have no idea. Is this an okay way of dealing with this? Should it have been taken away and demolished? Should it have been kept as it originally was? Because now it looks like a double double oppression, right? The cross on top of the stolen artifact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or... Or should I be comfortable with this way of making sense of it? So I think it's just a beautiful metaphor of how people have been confused through centuries. What to do with that stuff? What to do with art that represents the other? What to do with art that actually comes from an ideology that you cannot support? Um, the same discussion currently going on in Estonia. What to do with Stalinistic uh, buildings? Should we keep them as a historical testament? Should we get rid of them as a symbol of pain? Um, and I know that the generation after us will go back to the generation before us asking what on earth were you thinking by demolishing something that was so interesting. And the generation before me is going, I am not keeping that thing near my house. So the web of meaning just changes and it's about that discernment. Sorry, I, this was long. No, that's good. Thank you. Very insightful. I think I think Clarence is smiling because he you got more than you've expected here, Clarence. This has been very wonderful. Thank you. Sherry, uh, welcome and share with us your question or your thoughts this afternoon. OK, thank you. This is such a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate it. For me, it brought up memories of the bereavement support groups I led as a hospice social worker. Um, bereavement groups aren't just talking, at least mine weren't. Mm. Uh, we can talk forever around our feelings and emotions, you know, without accessing those really or expressing them or working through our grief. And I have a whole huge collection of what I call bereavement songs. Um, and if you think about it, think about just talking versus listening to Eric Clapton, Tears in Heaven. Would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? Or Garth Brooks, I could have missed the pain, but I've had to miss the dance. And especially Bette Midler's song, Wind Beneath My Wings. <laughs> it's incredible how many uh, funeral services that that song has been played at. And art too, because in my groups, I could just say, draw a memory of the person you lost. And they would say, I'm not an artist. I said, well, that doesn't matter. Just draw that for yourself. And that in itself could often bring out the most tears when they had been saying, I can't cry, I can't cry. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate this. It's been very meaningful for me. I have to say when I saw the title art, I was like, well, I don't know, but it's a woman speaker, so I'm gonna listen today. <laughs> the one time it has served me well. <laughs> but it was it was very meaningful thank you very much thank you and thank you for sharing that um my, my studies involved a deeper look into the questions of the significance or the kind of precisely um poetry uh and its uh its capacity to be the space where people negotiate death whether in the form of loss or in the form of kind of the realization that uh, that we are ourselves very likely to die um that that poetry as a broken form of text actually provides that space more than perhaps 
just talking about it, but precisely because of the brokenness. And the same with the visual arts. And it then links to, to that theory by Kristeva that says that this is how you can truly actually signify the unsignifiable and that it becomes meaningful. Do you know, I would just add to that, and, and Sherry, for you as well, that again, in a former life as a school counselor, uh, I used a model of working with elementary school children whose parents were going through divorce by using the stages of loss and grief that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross put together. And, and for each stage, each child would draw a picture of what that was like, of anger, uh, you know, negotiation, all of those things. And the artwork that the children developed was was really, really quite amazing in that regard, expressing their their feeling as to the type of loss that they were experiencing at that time. Very, very productive. It was a very healing kind of strategy to use. Um, well, Anne, let's come to you. I have to tell you, <laughs> since I've been coming on to this group, I am so intrigued by your photograph. Every time I see it, it just gives me joy because you look so happy. You must be a happy person. So tell us what you were thinking today. I think we have time, to, certainly, to get in your questions or comments this afternoon. Yeah. Hello, I'm Anna Mai, and I'm from Sweden, participating from Sweden, a city in the west coast, Gothenburg. It's the second city of Sweden. And... Um, Yes, sometimes I'm happy, and at that day, I was happy. <laughs> okay, life is up and life is down. And I attend the Adventist church in Gothenburg. 30 years ago, we, we had an old church. We had one cross in the, in the front. And in front of the pulpit, we had a Bible, that's all. And we bought a Methodist church because we needed more space. And here we come moving into a church where they had art, modern art. And you would not believe it if you, that it's an Adventist church if you came and attended it. Um, uh, glass, a uh, big... And my, you showed me some pictures of it. Do you have those pictures handy or shall I show them to people? You can show them. You can show them. All right, I shall. I don't know how to do it. Um, it it's, we have a big candelabra in glass, and it looks very modern, but it's made in somewhere 1968 or something by a very famous uh, glass artist in Sweden. And uh, some people think, you know, this is about creation. And... Uh, uh, you, you can see whatever you want to see. The Methodist church pastor, he told me that, you know, if you want, you can find things from Revelation, the book of Re Revelation here. You can see the, th the thorn crown that Christ had. You see the thorn there in the top. And then mm -hmm. in the glass behind, you see there is like a rainbow that is green, a, a slim one. It said in, in Revelation that in heaven there will be a, a rainbow made of marant. Do you say marant? A kind of green... Um... Emerald. Emerald. Okay, sorry. Yes. Yes, and no, that's could, okay. I'm just not the name. Don't feel bad. Yeah. We would yeah. call it an emerald. It's a bright green stone. Yes. Yeah. And, and you can see the, the red uh, wounds of Jesus, blood, uh, his blood. You can see streams of living water. There are 12 lights, and they are supposed to be the disciples going out in the world with the light. And when you when you when you put on the light on these candles, you know you just see more and more lights in as a mirror effect in this glass, and and you can you can imagine just what you want. If the sermon gets too boring, you start looking at this. You rest your eyes on this, and you can build up your own pictures. This was a shocking experience for Adventists to come in here and we had to start to explain what it is and still many people today don't understand it. Uh, some like it, some don't like it. And, and there's a light coming from, from uh, the top 
daylight coming in uh, on, on this. And also the pulpit is in glass, the altar table is in glass, and we added a baptistery uh, to this um, in glass. And uh, when the, the, the designer and, and our pastor talked about that baptistery, they, they um, talked about um, uh, the, the verse in Revelation that says, those who win victory will be on the sea of glass. And so this way, um, the whole church environment is kind of a different kind of sermons. There's also a big, big textile. And there, there you see the baptistry in the background. Uh, what I don't have a picture of is the big textile thing that is called the welcome hug that has a, a cross in, in the center. And when the lights and spots are on and you have all the doors open, all the glass doors open out to the street, you can walk on the other side of the street and you can see that um, your head will just automatically turns into that uh, spot and see that um, art. Also outside on the house, in the wall, in the, uh, do you call it concrete or cement or something? Uh, there is small, small figures made by uh, uh, an artist and it's people on their way to Jesus. It has been kind of destroyed because of different kind of reconstructions of the building. But if you look carefully, you can see people here and there. And it gives extra dimensions to the church service when you go there. Well, welcome to Gothenburg. <laughs> I think it's quite unusual for an Adventist church uh, to look like this. And it's amazing. Yeah, that's what I had to say. And thank you for, for your beautiful presentation today thank you so much for sharing this that it's actually possible somewhere it's beautiful yes thank you Adamash. thank you so very much well it looks harry i see that you have your hand up we've got just a couple of minutes uh but if if you want to weigh in again i've asked you to unmute thank you whoops Going back to mute. Yes. I okay. Am I there? Am I, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. It was. Is when was it? An An Maj, the the woman from Sweden who just spoke. Anna Mai. Yes. Anna Anna, say that again, please. Anna Mai. Anna Mai. Thank you. Um, when she was speaking, I had the thought that um, art in the church, um. Uh, the demands of art in the church context, and this goes for music as well, it seems, um, probably comes closest to those of public art. Um, the, 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 the bodies or the groups that are going to see work of, a work of art or hear a work of art in the church context are not a museum attending audience necessarily, where you'll have people who have self-selected, who are interested in art, maybe educated in art and thoughtful about it. This is a very general body of individuals who are going to appreciate art as such, whether it's a piece of art in front of the church, a piece of music played there, or a sculpture that appears there. And so um, it seems that uh, we're asking, um, we're, this, is, this is probably, this is closer to public viewings of art, like public art, the struggles that one has when they're putting art in a public place as a fountain or in front of a... Um, a governmental building, and we're making or asking, making demands or asking them to enter the world of art consciousness and artistic thinking when we make these presentations. That's the thought I had. Yes, thank you for that one. Um, I think. Um, I think this links to several different elements. It's almost like, it's almost like uh, um, churches are the space for kind of cultural advancement. Actually, we've really lost that edge, um, but but it used to be the field of churches. They, churches and 
the royals were the ones who who commissioned things, right? Uh, a lot of classical music was born because it was commissioned by the churches. Um, a lot of pieces of art were just commissioned by the churches. And no matter how much we want to bash the Catholic Church, what they always did was they were good at finding a space for the artists and recognizing what it can do. The same is true for the Orthodox Church. It's a very different kind of artist, uh, but it is there and it is a natural part of the religious experience. And what we did with the iconoclast was that we we attacked we attacked the icon, but we also threw out the entire avenue of art with it. And then we've stuck to it with our great passion for for enlightenment and and uh, and puritan motives um it's difficult to know whether the person at the time like what type of literacy the person at the time had of art but it is known that it especially when the when all of your material or your representations at the church were in a language that you could not speak because it was all in Latin, then the visual and the sensory was the thing that mattered. And the sensory was the thing that actually carried your religious experience. And it doesn't necessarily have to be wrong. Luther was right in the fact that you should also be able to understand the word, but it doesn't mean that everything else had to be thrown out of the window. So the question of literacy in that sense and of making church the space where you can actually, you could say more cynically, or you could say practice those literacies or be exposed to those different kinds of media is a wonderful idea. But in other ways also, shouldn't church be the place where you communicate in as many of the media as possible uh, to, to actually Again, assuming that God is doing that to us, shouldn't we be doing it with the same wealth and the same richness um, to everyone else? So, um, so I think we should bring it back. I, I don't. I I think that ch the churches currently who are turning themselves into museums to make those things meet, like to make the person meet the art intentionally. That's that's wonderful. That that is something that I long for uh, to see more of in our churches as well. A renaissance you know, this, of sorts. This is something you said that I wrote down in the very beginning of your presentation, that God wants relevance hmm. and that the significance of art is that he can be relevant where the art touches us. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I think that what you have shared with us today are deeply spiritual concepts. Uh, and I think we all feel touched by it.